just share. Wait, I have to put this here so I look at the screen. Sad that JB isn't here because there's one of the slides that's called Farewell to Plato. <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing. <laughs> yes, it's a good thing. It's always good finding that you are one bit smarter than the smartest person. Uh, so everyone, uh, glad you're all here. I uh, want to first start off by apologizing for my fashionably, what is it? Fashionably, fashion, fashionable tardiness. Uh, this, I hope this is a, a presentation where we can discuss a lot of the ideas because I think that in a sense, many of the stuff that's here is definitely not uh, more than provisional. Uh, it's really trying to work out some of issues uh, in the group from the group's framework. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion that's in the, the presentation already with many people. And uh, so in a sense, it's, it's also an idea for, I think, that uh, stuff that I think could be useful for the book somehow. The good thing is that there is a lot of written text already. So for whenever we take that on, it, it's easier to revise, I think, than to do it from scrap. Uh, it's called... a. Uh, so the presentation is called Sub Subjectivity, Militancy, and Ideology. This is actually like one of the, the big, you know, uh, you know how, you know, checks without funds, because uh, I don't know how you say that in, in English, but, you know, like when you, you, you send, you give a person a check, but you don't have the funding for it. And uh, when I, when we did the real meeting i was scheduled to give a presentation on three topics i had the idea of trying to discuss three elements that i thought were underworked in our framework especially in regards to the social mediation diagram but also there was a discussion regarding the monster diagram and also some of the anthropological discussions so when i did the presentation it was supposed to be a talk where i pointed out three problems I ended up pointing two problems. And then when I went to write the report for the presentation, I ended up writing about one problem. So at least there's there might be still a lot of some stuff in the gas tank for later on. I mean, not now, but maybe in the next semester or when the book's going uh, regarding the other issues. But uh, so so this was like, I proposed this presentation for the meeting in Rio. I never got to discuss it really. And after sitting down, I think I gathered my thoughts from the discussions also with people there and, and other, other moments. So uh, I'd like to begin with two citations, which in a sense, they are epigraphs in the sense that I think they, they point the issues that concern me because from the heart, I think that if communist was not an issue, you know, if there there was no need for social emancipation, social camaraderie, I think that in my dreams, I would be like some sort of lame Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, writing bullshit essays on stuff like experience and I don't know, sorrow, melancholy. But unfortunately, we don't live either in wild liberal USA in the 90s. Not unfortunate, I think that's fortunate. Or, and we don't also live in a in a communist society. So so I have no choice and and I can't be I can't be Emerson or the most contemporary version, which is just Stanley Cavill. Uh so with that in mind, I think like I was reading the political unconscious 
And there was this moment when Jameson simply puts, I think, like, you know, the the problem. The problem of why I cannot be Ralph Waldo Emerson. <laughs> because he's talking about the problem of social emancipation. And, you know, it really hit me because I think it was there when I read that, that I thought, man, okay, I got to do this. Uh, he said... He, he was talking about transparency, like an individual finding yourself in life. He was talking about the meaning of death, the the heartbreak that it is, the impossibility of dealing with it. You know, regular as existential themes for someone that I think with a Sartre background pretty much resonates a lot. And then he says that about the, the this transparency, that meaning of life would, in a sense, instill some sort of of, of not emancipation, but of tranquility, he says, but the cure in that sense is a myth, as is the equivalent mirage within a Marxian ideological analysis, namely the vision of a moment in which the individual subject would somehow be fully conscious of his or her determination by class and would be able to square the circle of ideological conditioning by sheer lucidity and the taking of thought. So, I mean, that really hit me hard because I think in a sense, one of the big dramas of militancy, comradeship, is that there is no way of squaring the circle. I mean, I think this is the squaring of the circle is the problem, you know? And then it says, but in the Marxian system, only a collective unity, whether that of a particular class, the proletariat or of its organ of consciousness, the Revolutionary Party, I mean, I bolded, not Revolutionary Party, but the organ of consciousness, not because I'm against, of course not, but because I think uh, it really hits of what we discuss of our own terminology, but only the, the collective unity can achieve this transparency. The individual subject is always positioned within this social totality, and this is the sense of Althusser's insistence, insistence on the permanence of ideology. So in a sense, it's like the individual is stuck in an iron cage and freedom or social emancipation cannot be felt or experienced from this individual point of view because this is the point of view that is forever stuck or at least cleaved between ideology and I think in a sense, utopia. So this is like what I said, the limit of the individual because I think that the, the problem of emancipation, it cannot be individual because since we are positioned within a social totality, uh, in a sense, the emancipation cannot be one that is individually experienced or achieved. Uh, so that would be, I think, the limit of the individual. The other part, and I think not uh, by chance, because I think Jody Dean explicitly states the connection. I mean, when she names comrades an essay on political belonging, I think the Bajuanism is very much intensified. And I think it's the beginning of the other side of trying to square the circle, you know? When you stop trying to square the circle and try to circle the circle or do your own communist circles, you know? And she says, comrades here at the zero point of possibility, what is left after everything else is gone. Remainders existing in ruins at the negative place of beginning. Instead of treating comradeship as the relation between Bolsheviks, in his novel Platonov, which is, of course, the greatest of all communist literary writers, uh, in his novel, Platonov treats the comrade like he does communism, both as words existing in an inchoate post-revolutionary vocabulary of rupture, longing, possibility, and laws. The new world has not arrived, but there are new words, words which don't quite make sense of the present. And I think this is very important when we think about the dilemma between political and social mediation, especially for those living on the steeps in the last years of the Russian civil war. Isabel Garo writes, in Chevengur, communism is the name of a world that does not exist, which could be constructed and that is already in ruins. 
It is also a more subjective than objective reality, or rather a principle of subjectivation. And she ends up saying, comrade is the relation necessary for constructing the new world, a relation present in and as the absence of property, nationality, and recognizable identity. But I think as Dean remarks and insists on her book, it is not, it's absence, at absence of property, nationality, and recognizable identity, but it is not absent of partisanship or taking up sides, whatever, however you want to describe this. So I've left open the difference between militancy and, and comradeship. I think this is this is an open question of determining what are the points, but in a sense, it's for me, it's like the alpha and the omega or the omega and the alpha because the limits of squaring the circle is the end and comrades are the zero point. And I think this is in a sense what was in my mind when I was trying to think of these issues. So I think like we can start very quickly with a refresher, like always good, on the difference between social and political mediation. And, you know, since we've started doing the, the meetings on CSO, uh, I think it's it's become very clear that the difference is not it's it's fundamental. Uh, it's very important, but political is such a loaded word that it really takes some time and effort to make people dust off what they usually understand by the term. It, there are lots of moments when we seem to go round in circles, and then when we see what's the problem, it's that the idea of political is not really coordinated between the people in the discussion. This is not a problem per se. I don't think that we we are interested in, you know, it's not the essence of the political that interests us, but the difference that we are able to establish between political and social. And a social mediation, as we've discussed, uh, in a sense, it's a, a social mediation is one, is a mediation in which certain actions are carried out based on mediations that are completely compatible with the world in which they exist. So we have like this, the, the, the great example, the never ending example of the school, you know. Uh, for me, this is great because this is where I spend most of my days. So it's very on point. You go to school and you very quickly learn that everything that happens there, in a sense, uh, it's constrained. And the, the, the diagrams are in Portuguese, but you all, by now, everybody has decorated these diagrams. So I don't think that's a problem. And you might as well learn a bit of Portuguese along the way. Uh, so the... When you have a social mediation like the school, it's very easy to see how it's constrained, how anything that you try to do very easily, it's not simply that it's resisted, it's like indifferent, it doesn't make sense, there is no space for it. So social mediation, when we talk about social mediations, we are talking about a compatibility with the world. And social mediation acts on the world, composes with it, to the same extent that it is constrained and restricted by it. So we can say that we are facing a social mediation if one equals the the three and two. I didn't have the little ball because of, you know, time to put the ball. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, political mediation, as we also can remember from the working through political organization uh, is something that appears first in a negative manner, you know. When an action is carried out which is not completely compatible with the dominant world, we can say that a social mediation will not be totally constrained or determined by the social world. Not being compatible with the actual world means a few things. So, and, and this we have like a negative definition of political mediation. If we have a certain set of practices, habits uh, that are organized in a certain way, uh, a political, we, we are talking about a political action uh, 
we could say that a political action is not able to be fully realized because in some way and at the some level, it goes against the dominant form of organization of the social world. Therefore, we can talk about political actions insofar as it belongs to a mediation that is not totally contained in the world. So it's a point where one is different than three and two. We've expanded this and in a sense, given it a positive definition uh, in the organizational point of view. I, I put organizational point of view because it was translated you know, from the Portuguese text and I didn't change it, but it's the working through political organization. Uh, we can give a, a positive definition when we say that an action is political to the extent that in addition to the social world in which it takes place, it is composed with something other than the world. In this case, it is a situation in which a political mediation is itself a part of what we call a political ecology. And political ecologies can and should be understood as an ecosystem of different political organizations involved in political process. Now, I do think, and this is some discussions that some of us have been having here or there, that political ecology seems underdefined. Uh, what, 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 what exactly is the difference between a political mediation and a political ecology? What is the relation between a political ecology and the world? What exactly, what types of stuff composes a political ecology? That we can leave suspended. I think this is something we still have to work on in a sense. But uh, we can say that uh, we are talking about a political mediation that when we we can see that it is a part of an ecosystem well, to understand the polit political mediation as a part of an ecosystem is to find the point of view from which certain actions make sense even if they seem unjustifiable from within the world so for example when we talk about uh, taking like taking a school and students uh, entering the school and occupying it. This does not make sense from the point of view of the social world, of what's expected from a school, of what it's supposed to do. And at the same time, it's not simply a negative determination of what a school is. There is in some sense, and we can see this in some processes, an attempt to participate in certain processes that are alike or that are deemed alike, like when we have the remembrance of other political occupations of schools and in, in a sense that could also arise a certain network or a certain point of view where certain actions which are unjustifiable in the world can make sense when we look at from these other collective sets of political mediation. So uh, from this, we can see that uh, there is some elements that I'd like to, to mark when we talk about political ecology, which is that to some extent, it is, oh, I, I wrote this here, I'm going to just read it, but discuss it as I say it. It is a fundamental importance to preserve the fact that every type of mediation is to some extent constrained by the world and also acts on it. So even if there is a if this is a political mediation, it is not autonomous from the social world. It is constrained by the social world. It acts on the social world at the same time as it is not entirely determined by the world, but also by the political ecology. So it's doubly restrained, the political mediations. We see that it is both restricted by political ecology, which is arrow four, and by the world, which is arrow three. So in the same way, it acts on the political ecology in the same way as it acts in the world. In this sense, we can say that a political mediation at the same, same time acts on the world, but also builds a broader political process. This can help us understand the expansion of the diagram. If it is a social mediation that affects the world, it cannot be said that the political ecology directly acts on the world because we do have 
this action here, but since it also acts on a political ecology, and it is also constrained by the political ecology, and that in turn would act on a supposed expanded world, which is a change we did from uh, this diagram to this one, uh, we can say that talking about a political action carried out by political mediation is the same thing as an action that makes up a movement of political processes that seeks to make up a wider world that in turn seeks to act in the current world. Thus, it can be said that the in the case of a political mediation, three is equal to four, six, and nine. So I think that this is something that's under discussed. We, we might want to expand on this, but it seems like the problem of transition is positioned here in the sense that the change is at the same time an action of the world, but we are talking about an action of the world when the construction of a political ecology acts on this new world, which in turn acts on the current world. Well, there are some open questions when we look at this, besides the political transition, which is something that we haven't developed much, but at least we've put it in a text. What the hell are individual, enriched individual agents and enriched worlds, you know, I plus and W plus? Because with regard to expanded world, we can say that it is a broader social world with determinations that are not completely subsumed in the current world. But then there's a question. Could it be said that the world can that the world can be can be and is restricted, but by what the world is? Because that's I mean, it's probably my ignorance in reading diagrams, but it seems that what the world can be is restricted by what the world is. Whatever that means, we need to know what the hell that means. And I think that in turn, that relates to one of STP's mottos present in an earlier text, which is communism becomes the problem, becomes the theory of how to solve communist problems and not capitalist ones. I think these are related issues. On the other side, and this is what I'll be focusing on more, we could also say that enriched individual agents are understood as in principle as organizational compositions. And I think this is a principle that we've firmly stuck to. Individuals are organizational in a sense. So like when we talk about, we are talking the, um, as organizational. So in a sense, an enriched individual can be understood as an organizational composition that is not totally determined by the world, by the social world, because as, as we can see, there is no direct relation between an enriched individual agent and the social world as it is. In this way, it is an individual form of being, organization, that differs from the way individuals are organized in a concrete social world. So I think there's this difference that we have to account for. What does it mean that we, what, what do we talk about when we talk about an enriched individual? One question that arises, and we can see this if we look at how the the diagram commutes, uh, it seems like the enriched social individual is the smallest social mediation in a social structure because all the arrows, action arrows are pointing out and all the constrainment arrows are pointing in. So what the hell does that mean? I have no idea. Uh, I think this is a, a good question for us to talk about, but this is not exactly what I'm going to talk about today, even though it seems like depending on how we answer this, it would take us in a completely different direction. But I still think that uh, it's worth pointing out before going into my proper presentation. So I think that we can start by decomposing the social mediation diagram in four issues. And the issues are like the areas between the different, uh, the you know, there are like, there's a triangle in the middle, and then there's these 
tra trapezoids. I think they're trapezoids. Uh, so there are trapezoids in the borders. So if we divide and decompose our diagram, maybe we can talk about four different types of issues. Some of them we've been working more, some of them we've been not working so much. Some of them are inexistent. The first one is questions regarding social reproduction of a certain dominant social world, which is the smaller triangle in the middle, which is one, two, and three, you know? So uh, we can say that this is, I think, is what we've most worked on. The theory of social worlds, in a sense, it talks about this. I think the, 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 the militant <laughs> trapezoids, I think the I think the the question of what is social reproduction, I think it's in that point. So I think that we have a very robust theory of what happens in the middle of our social media social emancipation diagram, political emancipation diagram, or whatever. I, we don't have a like a firm name for this diag for differentiating between these diagrams. This is something we have to a to do list. Uh, so this is like the more simple one. Three, four, six, nine. You guys see my mouse, right? Okay. Three, four, six, nine, the green one, are the questions regarding the problem of transition. I think that uh, transition, revolution, we, 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 we haven't like done a... So this is what we understand by revolution. This is what we understand by transition. Uh, but I think they are related to this green area in a certain sense, because they are addressed at the change action pointed towards the social world. So I think this is something that we should deal with. I think that in a sense, when we are talking about communist practices, this is one of the main thrusts. Uh, but I think it's it's still underdeveloped as an area. The other two areas that arrive, that arise, one of them is weird. And the other one is what I'm going to talk about. The weird one is one, nine, eight, no, one, nine, seven, eight. So why is it weird? Because it's the only shape where there is no mediation, you know? There's the relation between an agent and the world. And then there's the relation between an enriched agent and an enriched world. I mean, this is going to be like really simplified, but there's the, I don't know, uh, the atomized individual in the capitalist social order. And then there's like this sort of redoubling relation of the communist individual, you no. Know, in a communist world, it's it's weird. Like, what what the hell does it mean? The enriched individual acts upon the individual world, and then the individual agent acts upon the world. At the same time, the individual enriched individual acts upon the enriched world, while the enriched world acts upon the enriched, not in the rich world, but in the in the in the social world. What, what I think is interesting about this uh, is that it seems to appear as if this is a, a this is a redoubling. This is the first point. And the second point, I think that like without the mediation, is that it seems to enact a sort of platonic political theory, you know? Because the process seems incomplete precisely because the challenge is that the, the rich individual agent managed to not be constrained by the agent. So if the enriched individual agent is like, you know, if it's for some reason, and this is part of the problem, they are not constrained by the individual, the, the concrete individual, communism will arise. Let me just skip to the next one, but I'll, I'll get back. This is like the problem of Platonism. And this is why, in a sense, I think STP is a farewell to Plato. I wanted to put farewell to Plato, but uh, 
welcome to Platonism, because I think uh, the, the point is exactly that. But when we look at the at Plato's Republic, one of the main problems. Uh, yeah, it only commutes for the I plus its relation to capital's world through its own social. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I think that what what I think is weird about this, and it, it was very sad for me to realize this, but this is, seems to me a bit like the analogy between the soul and the city in the Republic, you know, where you see the city, you understand justice in the soul by looking at a larger version, which is justice in the city. And then how do you build a, a, a just city? by enriching your soul but how are you supposed to be a just person by being raised in a just city so there is a circularity that is present i think in plato and in aristotle also and i would say pretty much most political pre 19th century political thought which is the idea that there is a a, 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 a a direct relation between self-enrichment, which we could call ethics, and the construction of politics, as if the construction of politics is equal to making yourself a better person. Uh, I think this is very problematic, you know? Uh, I think Plato tries to deal with this problem through the issue of education but he does not have a, a it doesn't yeah i think he covers that love yeah i think that's the problem with most pre i, I mean pre pre certain political experiments which is there's a a, a, a positing of a, a, a certain analogy, you know, everyone will have their solution, but none of them involve the construction of social mediations, which in a sense would need another, what we've actually developed. So Plato tries to do this through education, but what happens in the end is like, oh, to be a, a good citizen is to do an intellectual media to to do to undercut this distance by an intellectual mediation. Uh, yeah, it could it could be. It probably is a, a confusion. Yeah, it really saddened me the the insight about Plato. Because I cannot simply read the Republic forever. Uh, yeah, that's sad. It's a very good book. So, uh, but but sorry, just to oh, clarify, uh, the the issue with Plato that you're uh, presenting is that Plato would only want the bottom development. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Plato, he would have. Yeah, okay. I would. I was going to do a very, a very cheap bottom joke with Plato, but yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, he would. He would only want his diagram would be the bottom. Okay, I, I think that's like when we, when we, when, when, when Plato talks about the analogy between the city and the soul, I think that is the 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 relation in the bottom, because he wants to understand what is justice for the individual. But to understand what is justice for the individual, he has to understand what is justice for the city because it's where he can see. But to understand what is justice in the city, he also posits the difference between an unjust world and a just world. So I think he's not stupid in the sense that he takes a just world as simply a negative of the unjust world. I think uh, Platonism is correct in the sense that uh, justice is not the opposite of injustice. So he does have the communist hypothesis in a sense, but there is no social mediation in Plato. And it makes a lot of sense because there is no uh, political mediations in Athens. 
You know, I mean, I think I think like if we analyze how politics works in Athens, uh, the mediations don't seem to be. Uh, it's it's very weird because even when they talk about political change, it's circular. So it's it's pretty much self contained. It's 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 something that, you know, one day I will write. A, I, I I will take this and try and develop it, but. Uh, he quits social mediation and W plus as if they are the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think this is this is true. Yeah, I th I think like it's 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 both things. There is no at at the same time, and I wouldn't say it's social media. He equates social mediation with W plus. I think he equates social mediation with enriched with seven. I think social mediation is like the arrow seven. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's a problem, and I do think it's a it it's a problem. Like if if we if we ever want to take a break and destroy political theory up until Marx, we can just use this this part, and it will be pretty easily done. You know, you know like when Derrida says, "Let's deconstruct all political thought, etc." And he does that in like three pages. I think we've got the, the tools to actually do it now. But this farewell to Plato is not the the like the objective of this presentation. Because I think that the most important issue, and like I said, I think like my my dream. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh my dream of being Emerson or just Stanley Cavill. Uh is on this yellow side, which is problems regarding subjectivation. I've put two, four, five, eight uh, as questions regarding subjectivation. Why? Because this is the issue. I, 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 I think this is the issue because we're talking about participation and uh, from the point of view of the individual in a certain sense, so there is a reliance on a certain notion of subject, but the notion of subject, which is not the subject as an individual as a ground, but in a very Bajuan manner, the subject is what we participate in. But so what I have, what I think we have is that two, four, five, eight. Uh, this is the space of its subjectivation insofar as it deals with the dynamics of how individuals participate in political processes. Uh, individuals, of course, in, the, in, in an organizational sense, as always. We can see that the process by which an enriched individual participates in the political ecology is the same as the process by which the enriched individual acts on a current individual who in turn participates in a social mediation that makes up a political ecology. So we can talk about political subjectivation in the same sense that we can talk about transition, you know? Transition is if three is equal to four, six, nine. Political subjectivation would be if two, no, wait, five is equal to eight, two, four. So... We can see in this diagram, I think what appears to us is that what an individual is in a social world in some ways restricts and constrains what he can be. So he's constrained by the world. And in a sense, that ends up constraining what he can be. Uh, but who would not be constrained by the world as it is, as is the case with I, but as it can be with W plus. So the enriched individual, on the other hand, is not constrained by the world as it is, but as it can be. So there's this like weird relation, which is uh, enriched individuals, according to this diagram, are constrained by individuals, uh, which are in turn constrained by the world while at the same time being constrained by what the world can be. Uh, so I believe that this point to be further explored involves both the dynamics of the transformation of an individual into a comrade or a militant, 
and also some of the challenges when it comes to thinking about the process of, of composing political groups, how certain structures end up being more conductive to certain types of individuals making up that group. So I think that in a sense, uh, we are here at the problem of, of what does it mean for an individual to be a part of a political group, you know? So I should read what, sometime I should read the critique of dialectical reason to see what the hell are those fused group stuffs. Uh, well, but there are some questions like, for example, I talked about militants and comrades, and I think there is a distinction that could, Jody Dean, at least, she brings up this, this, this distinction. To be a comrade is to share a sameness with another with respect to where you are both going. Incidentally, these elements of sameness and collectivity point to the difference between the comrade and the militant. The militant is a single figure fighting for a cause. That one is a militant tells us nothing about that one's relations to others. The militant expresses political intensity, not political relationality. So the question that I have, like, in this sense, the comrade, would it be the militant from the organizational point of view? Would those be two different things? I think these are, like, open questions. Uh, and especially when she says... We should also amend the statement by replacing militant with comrade. Comrade highlights the discipline of the event, the way that political fidelity cannot be exercised by a solitary individual. I, I, I cannot help but think about this relation between what the world can be, enriched worlds, and what an individual can be. Uh, hence the Marxist-Leninist emphasis on the unity of theory and practice. The bare incapacity of each alone comrade also affirms the self-abandonment of a accompanying a company fidelity to a truth. Its vector, its unfolding is indifferent to my personal experiences and inclinations. So these are like open questions. This is like stuff that I want it's best if we discuss together. But there is an other issue that I would like to bring, which is it's the end. It's arriving at the end, which is the problem of ideology, uh, because I've been discussing this diagram from the point of view of, uh, from the point of view of uh, composition, in a sense, right? But we can also, or, or like, you know, actions, reactions, more than compositions, but we can also present another, or interactions, you know, we can also present another aspect of the problem if we remember that in addition to the relations of action and constraint, there are also reductions. Uh, the way in which organizational structures appear to, I put here individuals, but in the case we are talking about the organizational structure that is an individual. So political, as you can see, it is possible to think about the compositional processes. This way a political ecology appears to an enriched individual. The way a political, and I think this is important, the way a political ecology appears to an rich individual, so hence the reduction, is equivalent to the way a political ecology appears to an individual in to an individual enriched through social mediation and an actual individual. So this is equal to this. But clearly, clearly, this leaves a problem from the point of view of the individual in the world because he is doubly constrained, but he is also doubly uh, reduced. He is in a cleaved point. So there is one problem. Uh, the individual will find it very difficult to situate themselves in a political movement due to the very fact that this type of ecology seems to be the place of a militant with an individuality that is not totally determined by where the world is. So what, what am I saying with this? I think this is a, like, it's like a question of focus, you know? It's as if the point of view of I is not where you can see the political ecology to which he belongs, you know? He does not have a clear view. The clear view is in the enriched individual, which is the individual in the sense then the individuality in the sense that is not totally determined by what the world is. 
So I think that the point, the fact that the point of view of militancy, which is I plus, the militancy is visible here in the sense that you can see uh, political ecology. Uh, the fact that it is only seems to be fully visible from the point of view of the enriched individual makes it seem as if the challenge of concrete individual agents participating in politics is not merely a contingent issue, but a structural one. So what I'm proposing here is that this is an explanation of the suffering, a certain suffering of the militant. He suffers, and this, this brings me back to Jameson's uh, insight. He suffers because you cannot square the circle, you know? I'll, I'll get back to this because I think this is important. The vision of a moment in which the individual subject will somehow be fully conscious of his or her determination by class and would be able to square the circle of ideological condition by sheer lucidity of thought and the taking of thought, this is a myth. And this is, I think, like, there's a structural explanation that we can give to this from our diagrams, right? So we can say that there is a deficit of intelligibility, right? The first deficit is the fact that the individual's point of view due to the place it is inserted in this series, it is not the point where political ecology is most visible. So we would have a deficit that is connected to the very horizon of emancipation, you know, as if there is some structural co configuration that is a source of intelligible suffering from the point of an immilitant life. But there is also a second deficit, and I think this is something that has been brought up, especially by Vito. I think like when he wrote his uh, intervention, uh, which is the double, the double whatever. Uh, it's in the it's in the Discord. Uh, I think that he points out to, to an interesting point that I tried to work out, uh, which is uh, just as the enriched individual is not determined by the world as it is, the current individual individual is determined by that world. So there is, in a sense, the the difference between this determination. Yeah, he is, he is, yeah, no, I think like, he could be saying that, but I, I mean, I think that, I would say that like, I, I, but I agree, we don't agree that class organization is a, is self-transparency. But if you guys want, I can put the quote here in the chat. Uh, but let me get back to, we can. Yeah, I think that's the point. At least that's how I read it. Things get clear for the org. I mean, I think there's a strong and a weak reading of this, right? We can put Jameson as like a straight up Lukacian or try and save the the old man a bit. Uh, not like he needs saving, but not from us, maybe. Uh, well, so it so like so. We must also point out the second deficit. So as well as the current individual composing political mediations, composing political ecologies, these individuals are also simultaneously determined by the world as it is and which they also compose. So I think my point is uh, there's a determination from this side and there's a determination from this side. And in a sense, I think this points us to the problem of ideology because we are talking about reduction because I think this ends up producing the sort of epistemic distortion that is traditionally described as ideological in Marxist tradition. So I'm here. I mean, we know this is like a an endless battleground. I'm talking about ideology here in the Althusserian sense, right? 
So when when I talk about ideology, I'm saying a representation of the imaginary relationships of individuals to the real conditions of, of existence. Well, if we understand from our point of view, reduction as the relevant information about the world needed to adjust our future actions and evaluate previous ones, a useful picture of the world, and I think this is from our WTPO text, we can assume that it is a kind of balance between action and restriction in the relation between two poles of an interaction. In other words, the reduction is what appears relevant to the extent that there is this interaction. When we think about the logic of value, uh, I think when we talk about value and abstracting in to the logic of commodity, you know, uh, we can say that there is a reduction in the sense that we are using insofar as the social environment itself leads the individual to abstract into the language of commodity. Now, of course, I'm talking about social environment here, but I'm definitely, I, I wrote this before, not before Gabriel's presentation. I don't think it was completely without thinking of him, but I I, ha I didn't have the time to, to go over what he did. So I think it would be good to also get this more straightforward. But this is implies that in the circulation, in the social fabric, this implies that circulation in the social fabric, that is interaction, ends up having as its epistemic counterpart, considering Trinitarianism, organizational Trinitarianism, the ability to see the world according to the demands it makes in order to compose oneself with it. So what I'm thinking is like, the way what will appear will be also what is relevant to the language of commodities. This is how you, when you interact with the world, you will also, what appears in the world will be this. This is, of course, ideology. Seeing oneself as a worker, being taken by the needs that the world of work imposes on individuals would be an imaginary representation of the real conditions of existence, of the need for individuals to be reduced to their workforce for the purposes of extracting value. So this can be, of course, better developed, but I think that if we take reduction in that sense, we have we can start talking without having to do much about ideology. And I think this is a, a benefit for the group. But, and I think this is like what's important for us. We are not uh, the individual. Of course, he is determined by the social world. But one of the wagers of STP is that the smaller triangle can be rethought on the basis of real experimental efforts, not only fantasies or idealizations, which demonstrate in their constructions the limited nature of the dominant social world. This is something like we are still working. I think there's a lot to be developed. But from now, we can see that uh, the social emancipation presents uh, 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 the idea that we are not simply determined as determined by ideology. I would say that returning to the determination of the individual agent's point of view, subject to two determinations, so different from the enriched individual, which is subject to the determination by the enriched world. Uh, it can be said that to the same extent that their point of view is ideologically determined, it can be said that there is an utopian counterpart to the extent that when they engage in political mediation, there is also another world that appears to them, or more properly, the emancipatory horizon of the communist hypothesis. Now, I am talking utopian here, I think, in the Jamesonian sense, not as like vague or fant fantasizing, you know, but utopian in the sense of the real concrete elements that uh, appear by the very fact that there are utopian elements in interaction. They are not simply in the subject's head. Well, so this is like the, the, the second part of the idea, the idea that um, when we discuss political subjectivity, 
from the point of view of the relations of reductions, we can see the problem of ideology, but we can also see how there is also an, always an utopian counterpart. So of course, you could be renaming it in another sense, but I really don't, I can't see any other uh, word that best describes, but of course, that may be my limited imagination. Well, how I, how do I think this is useful in a sense and some open questions that I think appear? First, I think that uh, the lack of resolution from the point of view of the individual agent uh, helps us think a pair of affections, affects that are central to the political experience and that were elaborated above all by uh, Vitor and Renzo, which is political failure and political defeat. So there's this quote from the essay, The Hustle of the Struggle, where they say, whereas defeat come from the world's external victory over the movement and places us before our enemies, failure is the movement's internal undermining of itself and places us before ourselves. The morning that follows defeat because we have lost is the collective reinscription in something that did not happen, but was glimpsed. The invention of an emblem for that which was missing at the border of the movement between it and the world that was glimpsed. In the aberrant passage from potency to impotence, there was a desire that did not find its measure and awaits to be symbolized. Failure in return, in turn, is the unwanted result of the internal constraints that the movement chose to impose upon itself of a discipline. Therefore, principles, organizational means, tactical and strategic choices. Now, uh, when we turn to the diagram, the large diagram, we could then assume that when we talk about defeat, we are thinking about the tensions that are imposed in political mediations based on the difference between the course of political action, 9642, just so we can Recall nine six four two. You know this path. I should I should have put the image, and the usual circuit three two. So those are the tensions between, which make up the difference between political mediations and social mediations. In this, we see precisely that something hasn't happened in so far as what is at stake is the world's external victory over the movement. So I think that we can think about defeat in that sense. On the other hand, in the case of failure, we can see the limits based on the movement's own decision. In the world, in other words, it's a limit that seems to occur at another point in the diagram. If, as we've said, the point of view of an individual agent is limited with regard to the emancipatory horizon in comparison with the point of view of the enriched individual agent, the tension would perhaps appear precisely in the play of actions, restrictions, and reductions between an actional individual and an enriched in individual. In other words, in the space of arrows eight. So I think that the problem of failure would somehow be located here. Uh, but uh, in a sense, it would, of course, involve the other relations that are related to I plus and I, regular I. Uh, but we could say that the dilemma that arises is that if the enriched individual seems to be the one who composed the political movement in this circuit, on the other hand, the current individual can only take part in their process through their ability to navigate, navigate the mediations that are in turn part of a political processes. So there's this problem, which is the fact that the individual, as we can see, it can the individual can only affect the rich individual through political processes. There is no relationship where like the individual acts on what he can be. He can only act on what he can be through political mediation. Uh, another noteworthy fact is that the inability of a current individual to simply become an individual enriched individual through his action. So there's the you can't simply go from I to I plus. Since it is he, it is he, according to the diagram, who constrains the enriched individual, who in turn acts on the and on the individual, 
then he can only become this type of individual to the extent that he effectively engages in political mediations. So in a sense, what we're saying is you can only become a better person through politics. There is no, there is no, there is no becoming a better per person through simple uh, self-care. Uh, so we, we can be gone with ethical Heideggerianism. Uh, it is if only through participation in these political mediations through their political organization's ability to, to inscribe themselves in the history of a political ecology that the militant space can also be constructed. I think that there's a, an important point here, which is it is not enough to participate in a political process, to, uh, in a political mediation, sorry. Uh, in a sense, uh, it depends on also this political mediation also being a part of a political ecology. So since, however, those who are part of organizations are necessarily determined by the world, it seems to me that the fact that the organizations we need will always be built by individuals who, to some extent, fall short of the demands of their horizons is structural. And I think this is like one of the, the difficult lessons, you know? The organizations that we build, uh, they are always built by individuals who from their point of view, uh, fall short of the organizations they are building. So it's not a problem if you are not up to your organization. Yeah, I think this is very important. This is very important. I mentioned this, but I think it was really quick. But I think this is like, it's it's one of the elements I think it's interesting. Uh, everything everything restricts i plus uh and everything acts upon the current world there's this duality which i think is interesting uh it seems to me that the fact that they're gonna, uh, the hypothesis raised here therefore is that perhaps it is in the space that it is in this space that failure occurs as we have said however this utopian horizon is not merely a fantasy but something that emerges from your constructions, which will always come from individuals supposedly falling short. Uh, so pending issues, as if there weren't enough pending issues, if, as if this weren't just a sim like what is the set of pending issues? It's the whole presentation, uh, the power <laughs> set of pending issues. Uh, this this lack of resolution helps us move to further questions. If the point of view of the individual agent is unable to resolve the tension between ideological and utopian determination, this is not due to the double determination point of view, but also from the fact that political ecology, political process are not fully intelligible from the point of view of the individual agent. Uh, it is only the process, the point of view of the enriched individual agents uh, that seems to have the clear view of what is at stake. Uh, in this case, it could be said that any lack of resolution connected to the emancipatory point of view would further, ex further force us to explore the area of the diagram which I've been discussing. Uh, so I think this would force us to think about what a theory of the subjectivation of the individual would be insofar as they participate in political processes. Uh, but this is something that is not without its ideological counterpart. So the, th the theory of a militancy would necessarily have as its counterpart uh, a theory of ideology. So I think that the, the problem of subjectivation has that uh, double determination. So this is it for today. Uh, ethics classes just got much shorter. Yes, as soon as we scraped off Plato's Republic, I think there there isn't much left, you know? Uh, yeah, thanks. So do we take like a five-minute break or something? Thanks. Okay, so I'm a that was amazing, Raphael. Thank you so much. Hey, it's great. crazy how much stuff you managed to get just by like literally following the like filling in the, the dots, you know. And... 
<laughs> treating the diagram yeah. as a color book. You know, <laughs> you know I, 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 this is something that I would like, this is, this is something that I think it would be good if like to, to discuss with more people because many of the less mathematically inclined people or at least in progress of being mathematically inclined i think it like simply following the diagrams and seeing what's happening i mean it it really there i mean there's a lot of stuff to do so i think this is like this is this was very yeah I, the, detective The task of work is fun. Okay, so we'll be back at uh, 7, 7.53. Okay, we see good. you all in... Hey, just real quick, uh, while we got a little bit of lag time, uh, in the Palestine solidarity thread, uh, I don't, why posted uh, a solidarity statement? Well, not a condemnation, but requesting a solidarity signature. I'm just wondering if we 
uh can discuss that soon either in discord or maybe next week since i think you rescheduled right gabriel so next week's kind of open we're going to discuss booker uh no at at, at at originally at least uh we're still going ahead with the environmental logic thing but i can move it the the problem is that we agreed to use the meetings after yours if i'm not mistaken uh Right, my actually, there's something wrong here because April... okay, so you were gonna reschedule, but then you went back to the first. Yeah, I was gonna reschedule, but but there was a problem, which is the current idea is to use the meetings on the 15th and the 22nd to discuss the book. So if we do that, either I have to reschedule for after that. Uh, or I keep it on the on April first. Okay, I mean, I don't, I don't see any reason why we can't discuss it uh, in Discord. I just, uh, I'll just make an announcement there and kind of just be annoying about it till we get some conversation. Um, but yeah, it would just be cool to get people's takes on it and whether or not there are any obvious reasons we shouldn't sign it. Because just reading through it, it seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um. So. Um. But yeah, okay, cool. I just want to bring that up now. Make sure that's checked. But no, I'm actually I'm 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 really glad because uh uh on the one like I'm digging into similar questions around social mediation, but just like honing in on I and W, so kind of go in the different direction. But between this presentation and and your environmental logic, I'm really hoping to steal a lot of good ideas from my presentation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> so I, I'd be up for it's... using. I'd be up for using a bit. I mean. It's going to be less developed than the other two presentations. Uh, mm -hmm. So my idea, I mean, I'd be happy to, to, to mix it, like mix the, pre the presentation on environmental logic with a discussion on Palestine as well. And so if, if there's time, we can try that. Yeah, I think, I mean, how about we play it by ear? Let's. I'll. I'll bring it up in Discord if there seems like a good reason to discuss it in a meeting. We can, but if we can solve it all in chat, that's kind of I part of the that, reason we got the Discord, right? <laughs> yeah. Also, I mean, so, in a certain sense, it there's a greater chance we'll have more people debating there, especially if it's something we're going to sign collectively. It's probably better to have it on yeah. Discord. There's a greater chance more people will will engage. But I exactly I and definitely if we need references for... or any kind of links and stuff, it's I think it'll be better. So all right, cool. So I will um probably uh later tonight or tomorrow start plugging that conversation more. Um, but uh and then we'll have a backup if we really decide we need to talk about something in person. But otherwise we'll just plan to do it on Discord. Uh, so do we return? I I think so. I think I know. Yeah, John is back. I'm sure if everyone is back. Um. So can we ask questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I share my screen? Let me let me make everyone. I, I have the feeling there will be a lot of screen sharing. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, a visual presentation, so it, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> I, just, I was just thinking from based on the way you approach this uh, approach this, Raphael, that we really ought to like in our book uh, build up the mediation diagram using the faces because I, yeah, I realized like we're basically, if we rotated this a little bit, it would look like a prism, right? Like one of these things. Uh-huh. Yeah. And from that angle, we have five faces. We have, you know, this face, this face, this face, uh, and then the other opposite side, because it's two sides to the, and then one at the bottom, right? Um, so, so if you look at down here, you have the five, it's like, 
we basically have uh, five diagrams in one. If we look at um, each face, and the bottom face is the only one that I think gives me a question because the other four you can find a, a commutative relationship like one is equal to if you go two and then three you get one right if you go two four five you get eight i think um and then if you go nine the uh, three four six sorry uh actually this one the third one also doesn't seem to be commuting we can definitely check this to see, but I, some of these don't commute in the sense that one arrow cannot be um, drawn uh, or set equal to the other three arrows because the, the rule of commutativity says that those other three arrows need to start and stop at the same point as the fourth arrow you're trying to commute with. In other words, like, in order, in order to say two and three commute with one, uh, it's the same as saying that two starts at one and three ends at one, where, where one ends, right? I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah, like the community commutativity rule. So sometimes these com these component faces, they, they do commute, sometimes they don't commute. So I was wondering if there's any meaning there. I mean, I think based on your presentation, I think there is a meaning. Um, but uh, but yeah, in general, what do you think about this approach of like uh, building up this mediation diagram using the the faces? Uh, basically, what you did with the by coloring each part of it, um, and then yeah, what what do we do about this commutativity question? That's that's my comments. Well, first, I think that it's really good because we could see though that like there are five 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 issues that we could say uh and it's very interesting because what commutes is the inner triangle the outer triangle and then the the base trapezoid right is that it yeah the base this one the bottom one doesn't but the the bottom one doesn't doesn't it commute like from is isn't it commute when you seven nine equals eight one? Ah, uh, yeah. In that sense, it does. Yeah, I, I was thinking commute in the sense of one arrow can yeah, be yeah, disrupted yeah. with like like this, but uh -huh. but that doesn't. Yeah, but you're right. Uh, we do have commuting. This uh, commutes with this. You're right. Similarly. Yeah, but Actually, yeah, yeah, this one doesn't though, but yeah, the other ones do. This one is. Well, I th I think that it does. Oh yeah. So the that only one only commutes with identity though. Uh, which one commutes with the identity? Because, uh, two four five eight is uh circular. It's it's a loop, not a. It doesn't uh, terminate. Yeah. So yeah. the only way it can commute is with the four identities, but it has to also commute with all four identities, which is kind of a weird. Oh, wait, wait. So... Uh, yeah, no, actually two. Yeah, you're right, actually. Yeah, it's a loop. Is that the only one that's a loop? Yeah, and it's it, so it's oh. very interesting because the triangles ones, they commute in the same way, right? They only invert. Yeah. The the base trapezoid i could you put like letters in them so we can identify like a b would, would that be too yeah much maybe yeah well it's like we call them i no 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 i mean in the in the the you, you extracted each naming surface. the faces you mean yeah naming just like a b c d e yeah 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 just so we can uh yeah so it's very it's interesting because a and a and d seem like the inverse of one another right uh b which is in thesis in what i was discussing two four five eight two four five it's like the the theory of subjectivation it's a circle yeah. uh there's this opposition in the transition 
and it's very it's it's i don't know what to i i know i i think like in one sense it seems like the ones that are in the that don't commute uh in the sense of a and d uh a push out it seems that uh which is a okay yeah it seems that it's interesting because it seems like the b and c and d which is the 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 outer trapezoids which are the ones that are square they all don't commute in different forms right mm -hmm. yeah it's like different types of non-commuting um, and in one. a sense in a sense they need the other i mean that's what i would take like there's an insufficiency to them at the limits i don't know yeah i, uh, I don't want to get in the way oh, of cool. i mean there's a name for this in uh c there's a name for this uh i think they're called spans but yeah i don't i don't know what that means but yeah are those like that three, the the only possibilities of non-commuting are there other types of non of possibilities i feel like maybe we exhausted all of them i, I don't know no in the yeah, square I mean, yeah you could have weaker ones in the sense that the actual equations are weaker, but in the general sense of like what commutativity is, no, there's, I don't think, I've never seen one that's different. I'm still surveying a lot, but I feel like. Yeah, if you inverted arrow three in square C, wouldn't you mm -hmm. get a new one that we don't have? Yeah. If and that wouldn't commute. Three, then it would commute. Right? No, it would commute. It wouldn't. It would no. It no. would on six. It would on six. Six would commute with nine, three, four. Yeah, that's correct. Ah, that's true. Yeah, we did like this, right? Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting information. But that the current structure of C is is uh I think such that like basically like those are both um like projection functions, like you're taking something like a part. Mm -hmm. So it'd be like the ability to take two things apart in a way that has the same parts. So they'd be like two different things, but you kind of get to the same place in each way. Mm. I think. Yeah, exactly. The Yeah, the projection makes sense. Like, it's like um, two of these, right? Yeah, that, that's the social mediation leaving it's 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 social mediation going to political ecology into the world. That's three and four. And six and nine, that's the expanded world. Uh, Acting. Yeah, which is weird because actually nine is going towards the world and six is coming into it. It's a political ecology acting on the expanded world. It's the inverted, the arrow is inverted there, Dennis. Oh, which which one? Which number? Six. Yeah. Six should be the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Six okay, goes that's to nine. Weird. Six goes to nine. Uh, okay. So that commutes then. Yeah. Yeah, but but actually, Dennis wrote the two arrows on top inverted uh, on his bigger di diagram there on the left corner. Five is going down, but if it's action, it should be going up. And six is going uh, up, but it should be going down. Ah, uh, yes. Five is going up. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, it, yeah, it's a expansion of the. So we don't actually have uh, 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 a reversing. We we have two different sizes of the same direction for the triangles. Yeah, yeah. two triangles are the same. Yeah, yeah because okay. actually. So this is what I wanted to say. The only commuting sub diagram is the relation between militant individual, political ecology, and expanded world. Everything else is built from the standpoint of that commuting. Not even the internal triangle commutes on its own. We lose politics if it commutes. Yeah, it exactly. Has to not commute. Exactly. So it's meant to, this is, I mean, I don't want to overstep because I, I know John wants it to say something, but I'll, I'll get to that. But I think that that's really important. Like uh, the whole thing is built for, I mean, 
you get a theory of ideology, a theory of all these contradictions from the standpoint of communist politics. You can't, like, there is no other place you can kind of anchor yourself in and you get a nice circuit that if you remove the, the extra arrows, it's perfectly commuting, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, by definition in our diagram, there are at least some social mediations that don't commute just going two, three, and one. But but I mean I don't want to overstep because I wanted to, to say something about this later, which I think it's the it's the problem with this diagram. Uh which makes the arrows ambivalent a bit. But I, I think that this type of analysis is really something that we've never done. And it's clear that it's really, really productive. It's amazing. Like just kind of geometrical analysis of this object, right? Like just thinking about its edges and its uh, faces and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and also didactically, because what, I mean, just from when we introduce it, it's like so much information. Because this is only actions, right? We don't even show constraints and reductions here. We're just just from actions. It's already a lot of information. So I think when we write about this, it might be nice to first start with the parts, and then we can introduce the whole thing. But anyway, that's that was my thought. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of what I wanted to say was some of the technical stuff I already interjected with. Um, but first off, like this is, yeah, just want to echo, this is really amazing. Like the first, like the semantics that you're providing, Raphael, is really super like, it's 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 really weird, actually, because I am like thinking about similar things, though, use, focusing on different aspects of the diagram. But it's very clear, like this is like a major problem right now is like going a step forward like the relationship between the technical and the semantics of all of this. Uh, so yeah, I really appreciate all that launching. And then this like geometric decomposition is super interesting um, because I, th I think, yeah, like, uh, like when I talk about it, uh, all I'm going to focus on is like I and W like just like a social relationship as such without even getting into all this. But I think this is really going to be helpful to frame like, because in a way, one of the questions we can ask once we have these this this decomposition is like on the arrow one, for example, there's like both the internal triangle, but then there's this other shape underneath it. And the edge is part of that as well. So you can never really like even if they are not commutative, like we're not saying that these are all equal. The fact is that that particular edge is equal, right? Like that particular thing, one is the is the same like map in both cases so we there is something interesting there to disentangle that there's always some kind of strange connection between the the both like the larger world separately into that arrow because we've got both like eight and nine and then also like the overall structure of mediation is somehow at play in there um without necessarily being able to determine how because it's not equal so since it's not commutative we know we can't say this is like that we can't say like we know that this thing is that thing but we do know that all these processes involve what so there's something really important there about one and we could then do the same thing when we start to look at two when we look at three and i think this is especially the case for the inner triangle because in many ways like the inner triangle is like life right i <laughs> mean that's that's essentially kind of where most of everyday experience you could say kind of like is even what it means to be like in a political ecology versus the political organization you're in what does it actually mean day-to-day -day life to be i plus versus i like i i think that one of the the values of this decomposition and the semantics is going to be like is trying to to position this fundamental kind of starting place we had of one, two, three, and this kind of minimal formal definition of politics, and then embedding that in this larger structure will give us a way to really then turn around and characterize very simply what is one, what is two, what is three. Um, and uh, just to kind of shamelessly promote <laughs> the direction I'll be going to, I think that there's a lot to learn in like actual practical organizing things, which is a lot of what I'm frustratingly dealing with right now. Uh, yet again and I think that these kind of questions and what it means like it gives almost like a more specific mapping when we talk about communist like 
looking beyond the movement. When we talk about communists, like thinking about the movement as a whole, that can still be very abstract. And I and I wonder if these are going to give us more so sophisticated and specific ways to think through what that kind of communist thinking through is. So this is really cool. Yeah, I think I think like at least from from I think this is like I think the the point about uh how it it, it seemed at least like for me I think the process is is as you said you know we start from a very simple difference I think from the the smaller diagram and and i think like when we we just try and 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 understand i think like filling in the semantics i mean i think this there's a lot to discuss on these issues because uh some of them might be a bit arbitrary uh i think there are some issues that are I mean, like, what what is an I is still like a problem for me. What is an I plus? I think the difference between them, in a sense, makes sense, but I still can't grapple on what does it mean to talk about an individual agent or an enriched world. You know, uh, I I still feel like something is missing. Uh, but I think it's something that like we need to have this. If, when we have these moments of, you know, hashing out these, talking about these diagrams, like in a more concentrated sense, I think at least we can understand a bit, at least about what we haven't developed, you know. Uh, and and I do think that one of the things that I was thinking is is precisely, I think it was one of the 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 inspirations was the fact that political organizing is at least it's it's like a it's a really weird uh how do you say a bittersweet experience you know i think i was i think it's that bittersweetness that uh that i was trying to understand through this through this exploration But I'm a bit, I'm a bit, uh, I'm still like taken aback by the the decomposition that Dennis did between the faces of. I mean, I think this is very uh, entrancing in a sense. I'm still trying to to think through. So, Gabriel, if you could, sure. Uh, I think it, it we could come back to this perhaps, but first I would have to also share the screen. Uh. I did this, I did something here because uh let me let before I share my screen let me just explain something. Uh I think that man I think that this path is really really good to open up a bunch of issues that I really think could be addressed by simply continue on the investigation that you were writing about. Uh, I'll just try to address something before I share the screen which I think are more just conceptual stuff that you got me thinking that I think we're coming to a position where we can address them. Uh, the first issue is something that I realized that I, I never thought about, but I think that we are, it's such a good thing to develop as well, which is uh, there is a there is both a didactic reason, which we used in the text, but there is also a phenomenological reason to start with this small triangle of a social mediation where the world includes social mediations, which include individuals, just as much as the world includes the individuals. Uh, and then you break that commuting uh, aspect and say, no, but sometimes we are part of collective things or we, we engage with mediations that imply actions and constraints which are not part of the world. At that point, every generic procedure fits. If you do science, you do that. If you do politics, you do that. Art. And I think that's why the best metaphors for politics come from other generic procedures, right? So it's interesting to think in which way other generic procedures, like 
they serve as images for those things you're doing which are not in the world. And I think that sometimes you can get that problem, which is they become actual substitutes for completing the diagram. So rather than finding in which way those concrete determinations are coming from a bigger political movement or whatever, we will simply say it's coming from aesthetics or it's coming from a deeper knowledge of reality, a scientific knowledge, or it's coming from a, a deep knowledge of humanity. And then, you know, or you're just from a, from a adventurous love encounter. And that's interesting ways of derailing the completion of the diagram because it will justify what is not social not by politics, but by asocial practices, because science is very asocial in that sense. Like it's building, like what is the, you know, like if we could definitely analyze the construction of CERN from the standpoint of our diagram and it's challenging value, property and affinity, but it's not really doing anything political. And then it needs to be kind of reintegrated into the world via technology. Ah, it has no value now, but it imagine all the application, right? But there is a moment where it breaks the, the diagram. So it's interesting to think that we can fit the intrusion of other generic processes into social life in the passage from the smaller to the bigger diagram. So that's something I was thinking. Of. Uh, the second thing that I, that I was thinking that I think it's also very important uh, I will get to it in a bit in more detail, but you said, like, I don't know what, an, what is an individual and an enriched individual. Uh, I think that the social mediations diagram, it has the problem or the dilemma that it is the most didactic, but it's also didactic because it's not completed as a formal to, uh, object. Uh, because if we were to be technical about it, uh, the, the constraint arrows, right? They are kind of arrows of belonging in the set theoretic sense, expanded to a looser version because you can belong more or less, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can, and because it's also paraconsistent, it can belong while by not belonging, whatever, right? Uh, but that, that means that what we call an individual, when we define it as the smallest subset that still belongs to the world those two things don't need to coincide right for example in a factory it's not true at least in the chapter manufacture in capital that individuals are the smallest part that belong in a factory there are smaller parts of a individual person that belong in a factory from the standpoint of property all these parts and gestures belong to the laborer but from the standpoint of capital, that's not true. The gestures belong to the labor process. They don't belong to the person. They don't get to choose. If they don't do those gestures, they're fired, right? So it's not true that the definition, the smallest part is still belongs to the world. And the individual in the sociological sense coincide. They might coincide at the level of the historically determined society that has mode C as the dominant and then A and B as the least dominant, then you say, okay, human individuality is kind of where things get limited. It's an atom. But for the general diagram, that basic definition doesn't really apply. We can't really say individual agents to be the smaller. Other things might be the small, right? So I think that that's something we're still working on, but... Uh, that's the second point that I was thinking of. Now, now the point that I wanted to share the screen, go using that idea. Okay, let's just stick with the belonging, right? I thought of this this approach uh, to start facilitating us getting to uh, a more technical description. And this here is using using in a very rudimentary. It's not the perfect way of doing it, but rudimentarily using the the memory evolutive systems. Uh, approach. Just one second. I just need to find the. Can you guys see it? Can you guys see the screen? Yeah, okay. I see. It. Uh, okay, I just wanted to to. Okay, so uh, what you have here, let me just use this. It's a bunch of individual relations, right? 
the small things relate to each other. This is not necessarily uh, this is not necessarily us going up, right? What happens with uh, memory evolutive systems is that you define this movement up here by actually a lateral movement. So if I were to be strict here, we would have to say that there is something that's at the same plane as these individuals, but it has arrows like this. From this standpoint, we get to see all these individual relations, right? We can, we can describe every one of these arrows here by factoring them through the arrows that go through this one object, right? So I'm, I'm just avoiding that for now and highlighting the, the movement upwards. Because if these type of objects exist, right? If you have these interactions, so for example, every one of these people interacts with some document which has rules. Well, if, if, if I can understand all of their relations, X, Y, Z, via the relations they keep with this document, then I can say they belong to a certain mediation constraint by a certain set of relations, right? I'm simplifying again, but it's just, to, uh, yeah, John. Oh, no, I could, I'm definitely waiting until after you finish. I want to. Okay, ask. sorry, sorry. But, but anything, just, just, just interrupt me, don't worry. Uh, so, well, wh what is the advantage of seeing things in this way? Is that you see there are more individuals than there are mediations. So you clarify that you're going you're you're going up a strata by also finding the place from which you can see that multiplicity as one. And then the same thing with the world. You're getting a bunch of relations between, I didn't add them here, but you're getting a bunch of relations between mediations, right? And there are certain mediations which are in a or, or which are in a special place from which you can see the relations between the mediations themselves. And that's, let's say, moving again, one strata up. So that's why I added, like, belonging is kind of this movement. You would say, this belongs to some mediation, which belongs to a world. And in this bottom direction here, you get the actions and constraints, right? This chunk of relations constraints how this individual can behave if they want to be part of this, but they also act on whatever is around them and so on, right? So this is a way of describing the internal triangle, which is starting to move us towards, like it's, it's focusing a bit too much perhaps on what belongs to what, what is a part of what, but it's starting to facilitate showing how just by focusing on this, these things get to be redescribed or better described by going to upper level, right? And there are conditions we can explain, which are part of that uh, of that kind of graph-based description of mediations from memory evolutive systems of why there might be cuts in the sense that one thing cannot be redescribed by going below an arrow, uh, below a level, right? Some things which are clear from the mediations level might not be clear if you go to its parts. There are conditions for that. In fact, a nice effect is that some of those conditions have to do with the fact that these things here might have patterns that are multiple patterns for the same elements. That's called the multiplicity principle. Uh, and it is one of the reasons how they get to exp explain hierarchy and complexity. So I just added this here so we can compare it to this thing here. Because this is the complete diagram. Right? If you just stick with this, you get the inner triangle. But if you get to interact with people and in ways which are not constrained or visible from these mediations, you need to accept that there are now new individuals or things at your level which allow you to see in which way these are points of view. And once you get a bunch of this, they can interact amongst each other, right? And with the previous mediations in ways that there might be parts of that ecology 
that give you a view not of the ecology itself, but of the whole interaction between political organizations and already existing social mediation. This is called classroom. Right? And what, what is the, what we call that enriched world? Is the point of view where this exists. Right? And this is therefore smaller than this. So you see, like, you go up to belonging up to a point, and you can only explain belonging upwards that point if you also accept that beyond a certain level of actions and constraints, you get this. You enter the realm of these two things. That's why you expand it at both simultaneously. Right? Uh, so this, at least in principle, should be possible for us to do, to redescribe, you know, and track this type of... of of crazy uh, construction, right? I'm just adding these things. So, uh, yeah, and we could even imagine, therefore, that there is a very important line here, right? But it's always asymmetric because the world only sees this, whereas this world here sees everything, right? These mediations only see this, Whereas this this movement sees more than the media sees, so everything on the uh, on the red or yellow side uh, extension, it sees what existed plus the new stuff. But you also need to get all this stuff done so you can have the points of view built from which you can see more than you used to. So for me, this clarifies a lot because ultimately, what the social mediations diagram is is the most didactic attempt at presenting generic procedures. That's what it is. Like, It is trying to account for the generic extension. A generic extension in, in, in forcing stuff, it's pretty much this correlation. You add a bunch of new subsets, and this gives you a, a world plus a supplement, which is bigger than the previous world. Right. Uh, so there should okay. Now it doesn't look like a didactic version. That it just looks like a crazy version. Uh, so so that's my first point. I think it would be nice to to see. For example, we can identify those uh, faces and and parts of the much prettier uh, prism, the the communist prism, right? From this standpoint. Now, uh, what is the other point I wanted to mention which, just before I go back? Is that that's why I mentioned while, while, while you were saying, Rafael, and, and we were talking, and, and Dennis was also raising his points, that it, there is a good reason why uh, only this big thing here commutes. In fact, right? Uh, everything else here. If you remove the rest of the arrows, this this no longer commutes in this diagram, right? Things depend on these other other parts, because it's a whole description under the premise of politics, right? It, the whole thing is based on if politics exists, then this thing here is constrained not only by the world and the individual, it's also constrained by the ecology, by this and by this and so on. Why am I saying this? Because I think that uh, when you go into the theory of ideology with all of this in mind, as you did, you you brought something to the fore that I never thought about very clearly, but I also think it's still up for discussion, which is the theory, I never realized this, but the theory that this is ideology, kind of reducing the world to the individual size so that it commutes with how they act, right? It's almost like in your, the way you present it is ideology is a is a is a kind of keeping track of reductions two and three with regards to action one, right? It's not with regards to reductions one so much. Like it can actually diverge. Like it's almost trying to make up for divergences. Like I act as if being a worker will get me rich. The world tells me that's not the case. But rather than updating my priors, as people say, based on that, <laughs> based on my poverty, I use the reduction that comes through the mediation of whatever, the media, my boss, 
my friends, uh, you know, whatever, to substitute that feedback revision. Something like this, right? But this whole theory is built under a bigger theory of this, as you said, because this individual that is constrained in that way is already defined with regards to this possibility or to this thing. Why is this relevant, in my opinion? Because this clarifies that the Marxist theory of ideology is a theory of ideology for somebody who has a communist uh, engagement. If you don't believe these things, your theory of ideology is this one, coming from the other diagram, from reactionary politics. Right? If if you don't, if you were to describe the situation of the world or act in the world without assuming that there are ideas, political ideas that are needed, and the only political ideas that exist are subsets of the world as it already is, at least our current theory of uh, of reductions in that con in that context is we suggested that we invert the arrows, meaning the individual is reduced to a social mediation, which is reduced to the world in a way that is equates it with how the individual is reduced to the world. Right? You get the feeling that the world acts on you, and you constrain the world. And I think that this idea of reactionary ideology is something that's been puzzling a lot of people, like new movements, uh, you know, how is the right organized? What do they believe in? And then classic theories of ideology don't function and people don't understand why. But I think that what you, what you constructed today helps us to see is that there, the reason why the classic theory of ideology doesn't work, it's because the classic theory of ideology places a contradiction at the level of the individual based on the militant and communist point of view. So it is a theory of somebody who could be something, but who is not. Right. Uh, that's the theory of all, even the theory of voluntary servitude, which I don't really like, at least has that underlying premise. I assume you could be something. Therefore, I'm puzzled by the fact you're not. Right. Whereas if you if you are in a reactionary world, the tendency is that you don't need that assumption to explain ideology. And when you don't have that assumption, uh, what reactionary ideology does is request people to signal where they are in the world's own mapping to make sure that you're not here, right? Not 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 trying something more, right? So like I was thinking that there is also a nice distinction between ideology without ideas and ideologies with ideas. Like ideology with idea is the classic theory, Altsarian theory. Like, I don't know where I am. I need a map. Uh, and then you can reduce the world to a map that explains where you are. Uh, reactionary ideology in the sense of ideology in a world that functions without ideas on its own, or where these things are, at least we don't analyze it in that way, is an ideology where you're not the one mapping the world. You're the one behaving to facilitate the mapping, which I think it's different. Like there is no contradiction. There is no contradiction between the individual like, and this bigger thing. On the contrary, contradictions are diminishing, right? There's something to that. So. Uh, I mean, we haven't discussed this at all. But I'm just throwing this out there because I had the impression that this distinction now makes is relevant from the standpoint of these two areas that you were, were discussing, right? But but mostly I think that this issue here is the one we should talk about because I think it's a presentation of this diagram that clarifies that some of the problems that he has is because these arrows are not just action of a individual in a social mediation. This is the action of many individuals in a social mediation. This is not the arrow of a social mediation on a political ecology. It's the arrow of many social mediations on one political ecology, right? So there is a many to one here, which is clearer on the co-limit construction of memory evolutive systems. It's less clear in our own construction, I think. Uh, yeah, I think like this is I'm going to have to 
to understand what the hell MES is. But, well, there's time. Dude, it, yeah. I, At this point, I think you're gonna you're gonna take it. It's not gonna be a, a big thing. No, no, yeah, but but I think that the this is something that it's it's actually funny because when I first tried the, the first draft of the of the text, I was actually trying I I th I think that this these relations of belonging was something that I tried to put into paper. I even tried doing like algebra al algebraic formulas, but I think like the the way that you you put it, it really really clear. And I think this is something that even uh maybe helps us understand like what comrade is in Dean's sense, you know, like as this zero point because it's like it's it seems like individual plus in the sense that there's this. There's this sequence of individual relations that are not uh uh compo that, that are not you know uh, uh describable in terms of mediations. So I think it really gives us a a very a very nice point to to refit that. And and I do wonder, I, I mean I'm not uh I, I don't know the technical, but would that like would that would would that type of reworking be feasible to put into the book already, or at least to have ready if this question arises? I I think so. I think I, it, it. Sorry, yeah, John. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna jump in. I actually gotta take off here soon, so um, yeah, but I'll sure. answer. Uh, that I think so. Uh, for one thing, um, actually, Gabriel, do you mind popping that back on? Um, I wanted to sure rip off of what you were just throwing down. Um, okay. So yeah, I totally think it's feasible. I think like if if we go back to like Dennis's presentation, he's already done a ton of the the groundwork for yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I agree with Gabrielle. I mean, I think if you're dealing with category theory at this level, MES won't be a huge step forward. It's just it's a it's a lot more in the sense of just like it's a uh, because it's modeling biological relations. It's just like a lot of pieces of it. But I don't think the logic is particularly crazy. Um, uh, and I think this is really interesting here because having this kind of like co-limit based model where we're gluing pieces together gives us an ability, I think, to have a language that lets us explain social relationships just within like IW and the larger process of political construction. It gives us like the same homogenous, like minimal framework uh, that itself induces like the change right so we get up to this point where we get to w plus which we can then like account for in terms of our diagram but we're able to kind of like build up to it so i think that's super interesting the other thing that's really interesting is like notice how like we're moving from i to w plus right we're moving from i to w so uh could we pop over to the um reactionary diagram real quick See, I think this is perfect. I, actually, yeah, if we could get both of them in, that'd be ideal. Uh, thank you. Just you. cleared this up so you um, can see it better. Awesome. Um, so, like, if we, yeah, there we go. If we look at uh, the one on the right, emancipatory politics, it also has the same arrow, right? Individual agent to world. And we have that flipped in reactionary politics. And I think this is where we make our case, right? Like Gabriel was saying, like the, the, the right is always conceived within the kind of perspective of like, why aren't they left? But we don't need to address why they're not left. All we can point to is like, they're literally going in the wrong direction. <laughs> like from just a very basic logical perspective, yeah. we're not Definitely. dealing with like a, a cognitive framework or an ideological system. We have like a very, again, like everything else, just like politics, we have a minimal description of why the right is wrong and we can account for the right in its own terms as opposed to needing the left. So like, instead of losing the ground of like, well, what do we get to this like relativistic place because we're like trying to understand? No, we get we get something even better. We get to understand them in their own right precisely because we start from understanding where they're wrong without kind of like having to internalize it in our, in our own kind of framework first, without having to make the ideology critique question of like, why have they failed to be left? We don't that's 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 a speculative question. That's a, a like in a in a sense of like science versus philosophy. That's a metaphysical speculation. Right. We're just concerned with like the actual formal model that lets us like 
model the process, right? Does this model account for the process? Yes. Can we look at something very simple in terms of the model that explains the difference? Yes. What is that difference? They're going in the wrong direction, <laughs> right? And then, then you can just like connect that to all the common idiomatic ways that people intuit. Like, you know, folks who, uh, I think it also makes sense why ideology cr critique often struggles to actually deal with the process of people's ideas changing, right? Like it's very good at explaining why people's ideas have gotten the way they are, but in revolutionary moments or just like personal moments of kind of eventual uh, <laughs> instability, I guess, it, ideology criticism is infamously bad at dealing with that open kind of like possibility. But it's like in a weird kind of way, this also gives us a sense of like that conversion process that Badu and others talk about, right? Like it's literally just someone has a flip in their perspective. It's unclear why or how. Again, that's but but that's our starting premise now. From our model, we can actually start from this is how we're looking at it. Then we can talk about the science and psychology and psycho blah blah blah. But instead of having to get there through those sciences, we're now able to kind of build up from a logical model towards those, which I think is like the ultimate. You know, that's that's how we show we're we're doing a, a good thing. So. Yeah, um, uh, on that exact point, I would say that, you know, we can explain organizationally why the right is strong. It is strong because it, it is reducing. So mm -hmm. it is removing, I mean, you can get like the classic description of the right wings don't tolerate contradiction or the right wing wants to eliminate certain things or make certain things invisible. Yes, literally, they want to make the world smaller. Mm -hmm. So it... Therefore, it's always easier to propagate because it's not introducing anything new other than the set of normative constraints that it, that account or justify this move, right? This is always the problem for the right, this. Why should you take the world as is and make it smaller, right? That's where it needs to invent some, some reason. Yeah, exactly. Because it needs to redescribe individual relations or atomic relations in such a way that some which already exist shouldn't exist. So it needs to come up with that. Right, so it's trying cool. to reduce these two things here. Yeah, it's like like the the there's in in a in a very simple sense, it's like the theory, the communist hypothesis also explains fascism without having to introduce new stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it, like if you look at a lot of, uh, especially like the Reich or the uh, um, Reichian or uh, what I can't remember his name. He was like a Deleuzian guy who wrote book Male Fantasies, but like the mass psychology kind of perspective on fascism um is like arrives at this perspective right they try to account for like how do people get to this point but they end up doing the same mistake i think that a lot of uh ideology critique does in general which is still ask the question of like why didn't they go elsewhere i think by starting from the fact that this is just what they're doing they're making the world a smaller place then we open up a different kind of explanatory like space i think so yeah I, I, man i think you, you really really nailed nailed it now because you know th this means we should reformulate the problem of voluntary servitude because the voluntary servitude problem is formulated as if both the left and the right are moving towards something else so why would you why would you submit to this other thing when you're not that right whereas this version here says no, but voluntary servitude is moving from something that exists to something else that exists, right? Mm -hmm. That might even exist even more intensely. So it's, I think it's already a bit of Althusser's point that, well, mm -hmm. it maps the world better if you stick to those parts of the world that are, you know, at the core of that world. It's absolutely the different problem from uh, why would Dang, you... That's Right, like what that's is... sorry. I just want to say real quick, like you mapped W plus to generic earlier. This would be similar to the other direction, right? Because Girdle finds a subset to justify continuity within, right? So we <laughs> we can now map all set theory to politics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like this is uh, this is the fact <laughs> that this is the generic, and this is the constructible. constructible. <laughs> 
<laughs> we did it. It's done. <laughs> Okay, All so right. now we've integrated being in an event. Yes. Yeah, we're truly, we're truly bad dudes, like uh, little punk grandkids now. So. Yeah. So, yeah, um, but definitely, like, if you reduce it to, and again, a, a good name for this, where only, only mediations, which we can call predicates, right? That include a bunch of things. Only mediations which can be explicitly formulated are allowed to exist. I mean, but you wouldn't even claim. Uh, that this is fascism, is just conservatism. Well, only predicates that I have access to are allowed to organize people. But the fact is that there is no qualitative distinction between being a conservative and being a reactionary because you know, in a social world which, which, will, which will have many types of predicates, some are paraconsistent or you know, some are classic, some are not, and so on. it's Choosing some and saying that these are the ones and other ones need to be negated, that's what conservative is preparing the ground for, right? So, uh, like, wanting, you can still, I mean, I think you can still go to the finesse of the distinction between, let's say, you know, conservatism as trying to keep the world as is uh, and choosing, a, like, a, a, a model of the world which, with some added property, Right. I have the impression that, I mean, you can still have to, to be a bit mathy about it. You can still have constructivism without finitism. Like you can have, you can have, uh, you can accept in, in your constructive universe predicates that have infinite formulations, right? Like an infinite amount of predicates or predicates that range over infinities. Like you can accept that, but you might. Restrict it even further and say it's not only that I don't want to accept, you know, this weird subsets that have no particular predicates. I also want to keep only to finite predicates. And then you will get something even smaller. Right. So there might be even we can even be even more nuanced with that if we want. But definitely that's that's the, the stuff we're discussing when we're discussing this diagram. Like that's what's at, behind it, you know. Uh, just, oh, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, John left or, or John left with infinitary constructivism for the win. <laughs> I was going to say before we end, uh, one thing that I realized uh, from your presentation, Hafa, is that, uh, you know, this fact that the individual agent when in an expanded sense, right, as, as the instance that commutes with a political movement insofar that political movement belongs to an expanded world and that we just said, okay, it's interesting because that instance is not, nothing arrived, you cannot act on it, right? It, it, it is constrained, but it's, it is very constrained by other things, but it's not something that you can act on from the current world. That, that really gives the spin that I always was looking for you know, to Kafka's very melancholic statement that Benjamin loves, the one about there is no hope, there is hope, infinite hope, just not for us, which uh -huh. is which is meant to be like for future generations, right? Or for fictional characters or whatever. And in this sense, you, you could turn it around because it could mean there is hope for from that standpoint, but not from the standpoint that you can occupy when you call yourself yourself right yeah i think that's it i think that sums it up yeah it's a really good point i mean it is it is a good you couldn't call it melancholia but yeah. you could call it bittersweetness i think right it's interesting yeah it's it's a nice yeah. inversion because you get melancho left melancholia when you feel mm -hmm. like you lost something because you're right Right, like you're the right point of view to occupy, but from that point of view, you lost something that's kind of melancholic, right? I have the right commitments. I'm, I see my commitments clearly. I'm ethically bound to them, but we lost, right? It's what we were saying about defeat and failure and so on. But the weird inversion is that from the point of view of that expanded individuality that is part of this bigger movement, you didn't lose anything, you gained. 
but it's not you. Yeah. So either you gain, but it's not you, or you remain relevant, but you lost. You know, like you, you, you yeah, can't no. get both at the same time. I think I think there's two things that we can add to this, which is the first is it makes a lot of sense that leftist because the in Brazil the Enzo Traverso leftist melancholia book was released by a reactionary uh, publishing house. It's not a it's not like a liberal. It's a really reactionary publishing house that takes leftist stuff. They can smell leftist conservatism. And it's really interesting. Uh, so, like, they they released the the conservative Simone Veil books, but uh, so I think it's it's it, we could even maybe map leftist melancholia into the reactionary diagram in a sense. Uh, that's one thing I thought. The other thing is, which I think is what I think made me come to this realization, was exactly the discussion we had. It was all Fidel's fault, you know. If you I, have a friend want, called Fidel. Yeah, if we want to some, yeah, I was going to explain. If but I wanted to leave the the punchline. Uh, we have a friend which is called Fidel, which is in the he's in he's been going to the CSO meetings, and we were discussing the loss of the, good example. Yeah, it, we were discussing the loss of the the courier strikes because it was very interesting because there was this group of militants which was working with the courier strikers and then they did a lot of strikes and they ended up making the organization the iFood the company have to change some stuff in order to not lose the the courier uh, workers etc and the immediate results from that was that there was co-optation you know so some of the leaders they were they started working for the company but they did get actually better conditions in some sense so it made a lot of sense for them to go into the other side and i think that what struck me was that you could not occupy the position of seeing the movement as a victory when you wanted to keep the point of view fixed in what actually happened in that punctual struggle you know in that punctual struggle there was a defeat because there was cooptation but from another point of view the movement actually had some benefits and actually moved the struggle to another and a harder also uh level so i think this is something that's really got me thinking ever since we had that conversation because Yes, of course, from the point of view of the leaders, they are failures because they were co-opted. But if you think that the point, of, the most relevant point of view of a struggle is a leader, you are condemned, I think, in a sense, you know, of always. So I, I've been thinking about that in a way. I don't know. No, it's really good. I mean, you could, you know, we could oppose melancholia. You know, there's a classic line by Mao of, you know, daring to win. I'm not sure if you've seen this. Yeah, uh, no, it's that's... it's like a classic imperative, and I mean, it. It. I always felt it was weird. Like, why the word daring? Like, it's, why is there any danger in you know striving to win? Perhaps that's a way of of defining. You know, like Badiou has the idea of courage, justice. Yeah. Like, daring is a type of cockiness, right? A type of kind of conviction that you can overstep, right? Perhaps this gives it a nice logical definition. There's a type of daring is something like yes. assuming that even though I have no relation to a victory, I'm part yeah. of something that has a relation to a victory, right? Something like yes. that. Yes, yes. I think that there's a point of view which this defeat is in a certain sense a part of a process. Yeah, I think I think this is this is really good. And yet again showing the the correctness. How the how the virtues of the virtues cultivated by Maoism are central to political <laughs> So so now we get the continuum. We get the. This seems like it was a. This seemed like a very productive meeting. I think. No, it was great, man. It was really great. Yeah, yeah. I'm really, I'm really happy to get to present this. I think it, it's gonna change a lot of stuff. Yeah.
Uh, so do we have anything else? No, I think I think only Maurice, myself, and, and you are are in the meeting at this point. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I think I think I'm I think I'm gonna take the the victory lap and and we can finish before nine. Yeah, let's and do that. It must be yeah, it must be even later for you, right, Maurice? Uh, okay, so. Everyone, thanks again. It was wow, it was fantastic. Really it was good. really, really good, man. It was really yeah, it good. reminds me why I love being in this group. Ah, that's all. so nice. Next See you, time. man. Sleep well. Y'all, same for y'all.